Good evening and welcome to our History, Theology, and Philosophy lecture series. Um, my name is John Hamer and I serve as the uh, coordinator of this meetup. Um, every Tuesday we talk about a wide variety of topics in the broad range of the fields of history, theology, and philosophy. We always start with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end suffering, to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. Um, we always remind you that all of our streaming services, everything that we do in terms of creating content and everything else is uh, viewer supported. And so we definitely appreciate uh, your donations. Thank you so much for uh, donating. That makes our capacity to do these possible. Um, this particular topic that we're doing today, we don't always focus uh, so explicitly on um, Community of Christ and the Restoration tradition, the Latter-day Saint movement, uh, but because so many uh, members of our community um, are doing this thing called e-camping, where their different mission centers around the world are getting together and having classes and watching Zoom meetings and things like that, uh, we picked these topics this week and next week uh, in order to have people come and uh, view those. So please feel free to uh, use the recording or restream this. And if any of you are here live um, uh, in terms of the e-camping, uh, there'll be Q&A at the end. So thank you for being with us um, on that topic. Then next week, um, in part, in some ways, that's going to be part two of this lecture because what we're going to do then is not just look at the origins of the whole movement, but we're going to look at uh, Community of Christ history itself, uh, but which after 1860, so after the reorganization occurs, and so that will be next Tuesday. Our topic tonight then is Latter Day Saint history from its origins through till 1860. Um, this is a very broad topic uh, that I'm um, well versed in, and so therefore uh, distilling this down to you know like one, you know, 45 minute uh, lecture isn't gonna, isn't necessarily that easy. So uh, we'll do what we ha can to keep it within that time frame. Obviously, I'm leaving huge amounts of things out, but hopefully, this will be things that are interesting to you, whether. Um, you know anything about this history or whether you maybe know a lot about it. And so let's dig right in. So um, first off, I want to kind of just set some context. It's always good to have historical context when we're going to tell any kind of story. And so um, if we look here at a map, uh, I'm a map maker and this is, I've made a lot of the maps that are going to be in this, including this one. Um, uh, if we go back to when this story starts, so the founder of the Latter-day Saint movement is Joseph Sif Smith Jr. And when he was born uh, back in 1805, um, North America looked a lot, lot different. Uh, so the newly independent United States uh, mostly consisted of the uh, 13 original colonies, but some additional Western states, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Vermont had been uh, admitted. Um, and, and in general, though, uh, it was still, you know, anyway, a very different uh, kind of place than, you know, frankly, even at Joseph Smith's death, more much less the end of the 19th century, the transformation of the continent uh, in that hundred years is uh, remarkable. So part of the context uh, of the origin of this movement, the Latter-day Saint movement, uh, is in fact the um, religious context in general uh, in North America in the newly independent United States. And so um, in this kind of time period, um, it was, it's called by historians the Second Great Awakening. Uh, and so this was a time of uh, camp revivals where people um, who are living on the frontier who don't actually have churches, um, they're largely out in their own log cabins and things like that, they don't have these kind of institutions that have followed them, even including churches. So when the United States uh, becomes independent, there's a, just a surprisingly tiny number of churches uh, with actual buildings that exist. Uh, and so it's only with this kind of um, 
revivals that uh, denominations start to come and there start to be all of this church membership. And so this is when uh, Baptists take off, when Methodists take off. Um, this is when that is, has kind of all spread across and people, people are largely Christian. Um, you know, European settlers in uh, the United States are largely Christian, um, but they uh, don't necessarily have uh, an organized denomination that they're a part of. They're, they're essentially having their own services. They have their own Bible in their, in their house. Uh, but now um, that starts to change. So one of the things um, that's also true in general, so is the background mostly is um, uh, in the Anglo uh, American universe is Protestant um, and so, or Anglican Episcopalian. And so part of the issue that happened um, in the Protestant Reformation is that uh, because Protestants decided to focus on the Bible and biblical interpretation, um, one of the things that that led to is just ongoing sectarianism. So as each individual person read the Bible, they interpret it their own way. And so as a result of it, they become a Methodist or a Baptist or a Presbyterian or an Anglican, or indeed somebody who believes in this, what's gonna be called a restoration movement, which is actually a broader idea than uh, just the Latter-day Saint movement, but those folks are essentially Christian primitivists, which is to say Christians who want to restore the Christian church as it was experienced by the earliest Christians right after Jesus' death um, in the book of Acts, as it's recorded. So it's not actually, they, they believed the book of Acts was quite historical, um, and they they just read it as a literal history, and they wanted to live uh, out the way um, Christianity was essentially lived in the book of Acts. And so that was their particular goal, whereas other folks like Baptists or Anglicans or Presbyterians had other things that were the thing that was most important to them uh, in their interpretation of the Bible. When we talk about um, the beginnings of Mormonism or the Latter-day Saint story, um, inevitably, uh, the way this is talked about is um, there will be a story where um, Joseph Smith, as a, uh, a young man, as a teenager, goes to a grove of trees in his, uh, near his home in upstate New York, um, and he prays and he has a vision. And that's the way, frankly, um, if Mormon missionaries ever came to your house and they, uh, when they're telling you about their church and about their gospel, that's kind of the beginnings of the Mormon story. And other Latter-day Saint tradition tr churches, including Community of Christ, often would start their story the same way. Um, however, um, that story, surprisingly, uh, was really almost totally unknown in the beginning of the movement. So nobody um, in 1830 joined uh, the original church, um, what we now would think of as Mormon church or Mormonism. Nobody joined Mormonism uh, based on hearing Joseph Smith talking about this vision uh, that he had as a teenager. Um, that story wouldn't be published until much, much later. And now, retrospectively, retroactively, we, we tend to tell the story as that's the most important thing and that's the origin. Instead, um, at the time, for example, when, when my great-great-great-great-grandparents uh, joined uh, the movement, when they joined the church back in the winter of 1832-1833, they wouldn't have heard that first vision story. What would have attracted them to the movement is the publication of the Book of Mormon and the idea that um, the heavens are and that there is new scripture, new revelation, um, and, and that revelation that specifically um, relates to North America. So it relates to the American continent and that frankly brings um, the United States and Canada brings the all the Americas, frankly, into the biblical worldview and gives that, uh, them a place and actually even a, a, a starring role <laughs> in, in the biblical worldview. And so the Book of Mormon um, did that, and that's actually the beginning of, of the movement. 
There's another actual beginning that is totally forgotten and never gets any credit, um, and that is that in addition to Joseph Smith, another key founder of the movement is a guy named Sidney Rigdon. So Sidney Rigdon had been an influential member and an influential minister in what it was called the Church of Christ, which is to say a restoration, people who wanted to go back to that primitive Christianity, like I say. Um, that movement is now called the Stone Campbell Movement. And if you know of churches that are like the Disciples of Christ or the Christian churches, those churches that come out of that, um, Sidney Rigdon is one of the top handful of guys in that original movement. And so that movement um, emphasized, again, this restoration of the primitive Christian church. Um, it was very deliberately anti-sectarian. And by that, it meant that they wanted to call their church Church of Christ. And it's a complicated problem because when you say our church is the Church of Christ, um, there's everybody can be called that, you know, and so in other words, but their goal was to do just that. They say, well, look, there's doesn't talk about the Methodist church uh, in the book of Acts. It only talks about the church of Christ. And so we should all, all Christians should be getting together and just being in one church, the church of Christ. And so it's anti-sectarian. It doesn't think that people should be Baptists or Methodists or anything like that. We should all come together and be in one church. Ultimately, it doesn't work because it just creates new sects, right? Um, but the other thing about this movement is it's millennial, so they are also um, a group that believes in a literal uh, second coming that is going to happen in the future. In other words, the end of the world is going to come and Jesus will return and there will be a judgment day and so on and so forth. It's also communitarian, or what we might even call communist. Um, so it is a early group, they want to do what they say in the book of Acts that early Christians did, which is to say, hold all things in common, um, and then everybody donate all of their property to the poor and to pool all their property together so that there will be no poor. Um, and they try to have a bunch of these communitarian experiences. So experiments. And so Sidney Rigdon is, um, at the time of this beginning, he's living in a part of Northeast Ohio, a little town called Mentor. And he himself is responsible as a member of the Stone Campbell movement, as a minister in that Church of Christ for a number of congregations in what's called the Western Reserve, which is to say the part of northeastern Ohio. And one of those congregations is in a little town called Kirtland, and that becomes important. And so here's um, kind of the map that kind of shows um, these two things. And so um, this is showing kind of how the counties have been established in the existing states at the time of uh, the organization of the Mormon Church. And also, like you can see, even see like Michigan Territory, where it's only just barely starting to be uh, organized. Um, in this particular map in the orange area there, uh, Joseph Smith grows up in that town called Palmyra. Uh, and some of the other early church leaders like the Whitmers and the Whitmer family are from that little town there that's called Fayette, if you can see it. Uh, Emma Smith is from the town of Harmony just across the border in Pennsylvania. And then over in that pink area, the purple area, I have labeled their Western Reserve next to Cleveland, Ohio, um, you can see the town of Kirtland. And so that's where um, Sidney Rigdon is. And so those are essentially the two origin places. Sidney Rigdon is leading a group of people and Joseph Smith is re leading a group of people in New York when uh, the story gets started in around 1830. Okay, so one of the things that happens is that Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith merge their movements together. So Joseph Smith um, has founded a church that's called Church of Christ in April 6, 1830. It has three kind of branches in, in New York, one in Fayette, one in Palmyra, one in Colesville. And then Sidney Reagan has all these followers in Ohio. Those merge together to form um, the Church of Christ, which is to say the beginnings of the Latter-day Saint movement, the beginnings of the Mormon churches. And so... Um, um, you, if you are very familiar with Latter-day Saint history, this list of leaders will um, 
you'll know him. So, so of Sidney Rigdon's followers, in other words, before he becomes associated with Joseph Smith, he already had these guys, Frederick G. Williams, Edward Partridge, Newell K. Whitney, Lyman White, Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, Orson Hyde, John Murdoch, Isaac Morley. These are big names later in the Latter-day Saint movement, uh, whereas people, it's only people like Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Martin Harris, Thomas Marsh that are already in Joseph Smith's followers before they merge together. Um, in fact, there's plenty more members that are part of Sidney Rigdon's church than Joseph Smith's church, even though, again, like I say, Sidney Rigdon hardly ever gets any credit. Okay, so one of the other things that happens right at the beginning of this story um, is that when the Book of Mormon is published, um, the whole goal of the Book of Mormon originally is to include Native Americans in the biblical worldview and indeed to evangelize Native Americans. And so right after the book is published, you can see this kind of map here, there is a... Um, a mission that's sent out where volunteer missionaries um, take a bunch of Book of Mormons, they walk the, whatever that is, 800 miles <laughs> to get to um, the frontier uh, at the western end of Missouri, um, where the Indian Territory exists, so that they can bring Books of Mormon to them and essentially say, look, this is your true history. You should be, um, come Christians. The Indians, Native Americans, the First Nations peoples, um, are not impressed with this. They don't see anything about themselves in this book. Almost none of them convert. But, um, but there's all kinds of European settlers along the way um, that do convert, including, as you can see, Kirtland in Ohio there is one of the places um, that the missionaries go on that map, and that's one of the things why Sidney Rigdon um, gets involved and ultimately merges his church with Joseph Smith's church. The other thing that we'll see is happen is that the because of this original mission, the early members get very interested in this last town be, in the frontier before Indian Territory, which is Independence, Missouri. And so they get focused on that as uh, a most important place for the end times that they're very much thinking about. And so Independence is in a county in Missouri called Jackson County. And so Jackson County, Missouri, the city of Independence becomes just incredibly important to the movement. So in that first decade then of the existence of the Latter-day Saint movement, of the existence of Mormonism, um, there are essentially two centers of the church. So on the one hand, um, Joseph Smith and all of his folks moved to Kirtland, Ohio, where Sidney Rigdon's people are. Um, and so that becomes church headquarters. And essentially that becomes like the place where church leaders are. Nevertheless, 800 miles away in Jackson County, in initially in um, Independence in the area around Independence in Jackson County, there is what they call Zion, which is to say the New Jerusalem, the place where um, uh, the end times are going to happen, and so the place where everybody kind of wants to move. Uh, and so there's two major focuses then of settlement. There's the headquarters, and then there's the place where everybody's trying to gather because they're anticipating the end times. Um, part of the issue is um, that the original American dream um, the, the American dream more recently has been to to buy a, a house in the suburbs with a picket fence and get a mortgage and pay that off and all those kind of things. That's the, that's the American dream after the closing of the frontier, when there was no longer any, any land that the federal government was directly stealing from Indians and displacing Indians and killing Indians in order to give land to settlers. That's the original dream was... Uh, European settlers could always go to the frontier, get free, cheap land anyway from the federal government that had been newly expropriated, stolen from Indians, um, and, and, and settle that and have their own farm. And so the problem with Kirtland, if we you know, just even go back to where that was here on the map, is that it's in this pre-settled area. So all of the farms and everything like that are already owned by people, so the land is quite expensive. So people, generally speaking, poor people that are attracted to Mormonism and want to live with all things in common and that kind of thing, they can't 
afford farms in Kirtland, but they can go to the frontier. They can go to Missouri, um, where and land is just amazingly inexpensive. And so it, by far, even though the headquarters is in Ohio, the larger number of members actually move to Missouri. That also initially is the place where the church's printing house, the um, uh, their new church's newspaper and everything else are there. And um, anyway, so that's a that's the new two nucleuses of the church, two nuclei. Um, I mentioned that uh, they were very interested in building, let's say, the New Jerusalem. They wanted to create a city of Zion. And so uh, they did like everybody else in 19th century America, where they, they everybody was founding planned communities. And so they created what's called the Plat of Zion, how they wanted to make the city of independence, this perfect, geometrically perfect, divine city that has as you can see kind of in the middle of that 24 temples um, that would be at the heart of it so that's where um, Jesus will come back and reign on earth in a for a thousand years in a millennial kingdom they also did the same for Kirtland and so they tried to plat out Kirtland and they uh, set aside as a lot there for to build three temples at the center of of their plat uh, and so those are um, the two different anyway the diff different plans for building these kinds of perfect communities. Um, this later became the model for Latter-day Saint colonization. Um, if you go to Utah, almost all of the towns in Utah are laid out according to this same kind of idea because they go back to this plat of Zion and they want to uh, build um, Zionic communities. So I mentioned um, that they envision multiple temples. And so if we zero in on the uh, plat of Kirtland, Ohio, um, originally the plan you can see here would have been to build three temples for whatever reason, right next to each other, right in the middle of the, the planned city. Um, here's a map though of the actual reality. So if we take that plat, I don't know if you can see this on the map, but anyway, you can take where that plat fits in terms of that extended plat, the land that the Mormons actually owned is just a very tiny portion of that. So they owned, uh, Isaac Morley owned a farm, Peter French owned a farm, Frederick G. Williams owned a farm. And so they were able to build one temple on, on that land and they made some of the roads and some of those roads like, um, like it's now called Joseph Street and, um, and uh, I think there's one that's called Cowdery Street, but anyway, a couple, yeah, a couple of those original roads got built, but in general, none of this really exists. So they never, they planned to do it, but they never were able to buy all of those farms. It would have been just um, too expensive. And so that was, um, you know, as they started to make Kirtland or remake Kirtland according to their um, ideal communitarian um, concept. Uh, it never really worked because if you didn't, they didn't have the money to buy land in already pre-developed areas. Um, so they tried to build a temple. We have here um, a a diagram of the original. Um, this is the original plan. Um, there probably wasn't a plan for the temple in Kirtland because people back then didn't necessarily use plans, but they had to ha make a plan so that they could send it to the people that are in Missouri to tell them what they were going to do. And you can see here in the plan, they spent all of this time drawing all the tracings on the windows and things like that. It's not really a particularly useful plan, um, but they, uh, one of the things you can see in the plan, for example, they just have a line between the first and the second stories. They don't even have any of the engineering, any of the things that would be necessary to have floors in between. They just haven't anticipated that because they've never drawn plans like this before. Um, you can see it, how they also, again, the plan for the Independence Temple here and Kirtland Temple, when they've, the one that's actually is much kind of taller, you know, than it is than the one in the plan, because again, they had to include all of that actual like floor space you can't just make a floor be a line you know what i mean and so this is how um uh going between their kind of planned vision and actual built reality um one of the things we can see in the plan um so on the one hand we have the plan on the left on the right is um 
I think it's a whether it's the U.S. it's like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Somebody in the in the Great Depression um, p paid for uh, workers to go around and make architectural diagrams of important historical places, and so they went and did one at Kirtland Temple, and that's one of our wonderful um, plans that we have of that. And you can kind of see on it. Um, this is what the ground floor of the temple looks like with all of its pew boxes and you can see in the um, in the corners are the four choir boxes but then what's one of the interesting things that you see in it and it's in the in the plan at left is also this very weird and distinctive thing of having nine pulpits on either side uh, in actually it's actually 12 if you count the lower table so 12 on either side so which is a very um, significant kind of holy number. Anyway, so we'll go back to that later. They wanted to build, as I say, a temple uh, in independence. So just to say on the Indian frontier here in this frontier territory. Uh, but um, one of the things that they found was that the, the locals, when you're on the frontier, the local settlers um, were very hostile to their plans. And ultimately, um, the Missourian residents, the old settlers, um, successfully um, used mob violence to um, force uh, the early Latter-day Saint settlers from their property and their different branches um, out of the county, and they refused to let them back in. And so as a result of that, they all got kicked out of Jackson County, and the good desire and the goal of building a temple in independence um, ended up being uh, totally unfulfilled until you know the 1990s when the temple was finally built there the one of the first responses um, uh, that I mean there was a couple attempts to to uh, to write redresses to the governor and this kind of thing there was no way to legally to uh, get people to allow people to come back to their property the people in Jackson County were like we got rid of you and we're not letting you back in and so um, in 1834, um, members decided, church leaders decided that they would actually organize their own illegal militia and march it from Kirtland, Ohio, all the way to Missouri so that they could, under arms, um, escort the refugees back to their land in Jackson County. And so they essentially to create a, an army of Israel, they look to the book of Judges and the, uh, the the fights that the Israelites that the uh, that the people, for example, in the story of Gideon had against uh, their enemies, and they had the same sense that after they marched those 800 miles, they would have a battle with the Missourians, that God would be on their side, and they would be able to bring uh, everybody back. Um, they this totally failed <laughs> so um, when they got there they were hopelessly outnumbered um, they uh, had to not um, they had to sue for peace um, they uh, also everybody in the in the mil militia um, got cholera and so there was it just ended up being a total fiasco but one of the things that came out of it is that all of the people who did go on the march all the men who went there including people like Lyman White and Brigham Young and like my great 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 grandfather Stephen Winchester when they came back they were uh, organized into new um, into new leadership callings and so uh, at the end of this um, Joseph Smith organizes a council of 12 apostles and so 12 of the leading uh, people who were on the march became apostles and then another whole group including my uh, again, great, 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 great grandfather became one of the 70s um, that was organized as a result of this. All right. So while um, things aren't working out in Missouri, um, things are working out a little better in Ohio. And so they um, are finally able and actually able to one of the main core successes of the early movement was their ability to actually build the Kirtland Temple. And so nobody really in the church had much experience building a structure that large. Um, originally, I mean, they would have known how to build their own kind of log cabins and things like that. They've done that. But um, if you look at the thing, you think it's like maybe smaller than it is, but you can see here in this uh, historic photo, um, its size and scale next to um, an old schoolhouse, church house that it was next to it is much smaller. So um, 
when they made the plan of it, it's kind of like a scaled up version of what they, um, they wanted to make something amazing, right? Like I said, it was probably built without detailed plans. The plans that they drew up were probably to send just to independence and they just didn't need plans and didn't use plans. We're, 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 it's impossible for us to even think of how you operate without maps or, or written plans or diagrams or anything like that, but we're um, now so much more visual than people were in the past. Because they didn't know um, any of this engineering stuff, the, the temple itself lacked an adequate footing for its foundation. Um, and indeed, the exterior facade doesn't really even take the interior into account. And so on the, you can see on the side windows there, those left windows, those are actually obscured by the, um, by the stairwells because um, they didn't think about what the inside would look like uh, compared to the outside. They initially wanted to build it out of brick um, they didn't know how to make bricks, so the bricks all fell apart. Uh, and they later built it out of rubble stone construction, and then they covered the rubber, rubble stone with plaster. And so that's what the temple ends up being built out of. Um, and as we were talking about in the plans, um, one of the distinctive uh, features of this was a set of pulpits. And so on both first and second stories, which are, are essentially uh, chapels, uh, they're called the upper and lower courts. Um, on either side, there's a series of nine pulpits, including then a table at the front, which makes it a total of about 12. Um, and and they're, it's a very strange and distinctive looking thing. There are also these veils. In the original temple, the original idea of the veils are, these are dividers that can come down so that you can separate um, the space into multiple rooms so that they could have cl different classes. All right. Hopefully you're still with me with all, after all this. This is a lot of, a lot of information. <laughs> so when the thing first gets started in 1830, just ignore the green part of this chart. The entire structure of the church is that there are, according to, as they've read in the New Testament, they're aware of there being essentially three offices in priesthood. So they talk about in the New Testament, they talk about teachers and priests and elders. Um, and they also have, their understanding is that elders, as they're called in the New Testament, are the same as apostles. And so um, the whole structure of the church is that there are teachers, priests, and elders. Uh, there's a first elder and a second elder, which are Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, and that those are the same as apostles. Um, by the time um, the church merged, the two churches merged, and they have the 1833 structure, they have, they have evolved their thinking. And so now they understand there to be a higher priesthood and a lesser priesthood. Um, eventually, the people who are ordained to higher priesthood become called high priests, and there becomes what's known as a presidents of the high priesthood. Um, but they've also then added uh, other jobs, including deacons, and they've added pastors. Um, so the presiding elder of each congregation, which are called branches at this time, are also called pastors. And then they also have added bishops. And so in their understanding, bishops are to be financial officers. And the idea of it is that because they're having communitarian experiments where donating their property and living with things in common or they're being part of an agricultural, shared agricultural commune, the bishop then is in charge of the, the shared physical property. So there's a bishop's storehouse that includes um, the plows or something like that that everybody gets to use. And so that's the structure that exists in 1833. And now if we move forward, you can see by the time they're building the Kirtland Temple, this structure now has gotten much more vast. And so we've added, in addition to that, uh, the presidents of the high priesthood are now thought of as a first presidency. We've added the roles of evangelists slash patriarchs um, uh, who uh, have a special calling where they give uh, blessings that are similar to the blessings that Jacob gave each of his sons in the book uh, of Genesis. We have um, presidencies of the two nucleuses. So there's Kirtland and there's Zion, which is to say Missouri. And so there's presidencies of each of those different regions where the church is established. And then there's also high councils of those two groups. And as I mentioned, they've also, after the Zion's camp structure, they've also created a traveling high council of 12 with a president and that's known as the 12 apostles and then they've also created a job 
uh, that's similar to apostles. It's instead of 12 apostles, it's another 70 apostles. Actually, it's never, it's never, they never use the number 70. There's more than 70 70s and they have presidents of those 70. And so anyway, as you can kind of see, um, uh, the structure is rapidly changing, and indeed, almost everything in this um, faith tradition is changing. By the t when they started uh, with those just first three jobs, um, they were really focusing on being Christian primitivists, of only having jobs, um, only having church as it existed in the book of Acts and the New Testament. Now, by the time they got into 1835, I mean, people, they don't have patriarchs or evangelists in the New Testament. They have evangelists in the New Testament. They're not patriarchs. Um, they don't have a first presidency in the New Testament. Um, so they don't have high councils in, and that kind of thing in the New Testament. And so now they have um, expanded their idea. They don't have high priests really in the New Testament. So they, they've expanded their idea now of of what they're doing. And it's not only that they're trying to live out the book of Acts anymore by, by 1835. So I mentioned these pulpits. And so why do they have 12 pulpits on either side? And so part of it is that in order to show that crazy structure that I just said and try to explain it to people who aren't, um, who, who learn things visually, um, the pulpit structure actually kind of shows uh, the priesthood structure of the developing church. And so the Thais pulpits are for the first presidency, then for the presidents of the high council, then for the presidents of the high priests, presidents of the elders and then on the other side on the ironic side the lesser priesthood side is the presidents the bishops that are overseeing the ironic priesthood the priests the teachers and the deacons um, and so uh, and everybody kind of doesn't even realize it but they think about it because apostles become so important in this movement there's no pulpit at all for apostles and we kind of ask well why aren't there any why is there no place for the apostles or the 70s and the answer is, is that apostles and 70s are not supposed to be in the temple and headquarters their their entire job is going out and evangelizing they're supposed to be doing um converting people to the movement and so the apostles aren't supposed to be there all right <laughs> so when um like i say the kirtland temple is actually successfully built and they dedicate it this is one of the the great triumphs that the early movement has. They have a huge number of setbacks, but one thing that they actually accomplish is, is building this just amazingly big structure, something that's beyond what they really were capable of doing. They bankrupted themselves to build it. Uh, and so when they have their dedication in 1836, um, they look back on this as just this time as a Pentecostal season. You know, again, calling this... Um, looking back to this time period, for example, in the book of Acts, uh, the, the miracles of Pentecost as described in the book of Acts, where the spirit is pouring out um, among uh, the early Christian community. The Latter-day Saint movement feels the same thing in 1836 with the dedication of Kirtland Temple. So thousands of people attend this dedication. The members report this amazing endow uh, outpouring of the spirit, which is called the endowment, the you know people being endowed with power of the spirit. People report visions of Christ and ancient prophets. They speak in tongues, uh, which is also part of the um, description of what happened in the book of Acts. So in imitation of Acts, they are also doing this kind of glossolalia. One of the crowning moments of the early Latter-day Saint experience. And so in that sense, there was a feeling that the blessings of the primitive church as recorded in Acts 2 had been restored. And so I have here like the diagram here. One of the things that occurred is Emma Smith had been called um, to create a hymnal. Hymnals are just amazingly important in the church, lived church experience. Um, and that was published in time for the dedication. And that included as the very last hymn in the hymnal, a hymn called The Spirit of God, Like a Fire is Burning, um, which has ended up being a real anthem of the whole movement it was sung at the dedication. Okay, so remembering again that context I showed you at the beginning of this lecture of what the United States looked like when Joseph Smith was born, just a couple um, states in the frontier beyond those original colonies that had been settled much earlier by Europeans, by the British, um, well, by other people too. The British took them from those from the other European states. So by the time we get to 1837, so by the time Kirtland Temple is dedicated. Um, this is expanded much 
more, more substantially. So you can see um, the U.S. is all the way to uh, Missouri and, and, and so on. And so those are all, uh, those states are already organized. And indeed now uh, there's this thing that's happened where uh, Americans have crossed into Mexico and have uh, settled Texas and have declared themselves to be independent of Mexico and created what they call a republic um, there. So that's not that's totally disputed. The Mexicans uh, Mexico doesn't recognize that. But anyway, that's the um, kind of the, the how it's all looking. You can see uh, the U.S. is is having this century of just amazing and rapid growth and. Um, that is the background context, frankly, of what's going on at this movement, too. So we mentioned already that there were these two nuclei, Kirtland and Zion or Missouri. So I want to check in on what's been going on in Missouri while the people at headquarters, while the people in Ohio are building a temple. So the person who's been called ever since that mil uh, militia march um, that the early church members had all the way to Missouri to try to recover uh, and, and failing to recover uh, the lands uh, in Jackson County, Missouri. Um, the guy who's been called to be the president of the church in Missouri is a guy named David Whitmer. Uh, and David Whitmer had been one of the very earliest members of the church. He was one of what's called the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. So he's one of the people who um, had a special vision where he saw the angel uh, and saw the, uh, saw the plates in a vision. And so he became... Um, he was the member of the church to be baptized, so after Oliver Cowdery and members of the Smith family. And in 1834, he was ordained president of the church in Zion. Um, he was also ordained at that time to be Joseph Smith's successor. So if Joseph, anything happened to Joseph Smith, um, David Wimber was sort of like vice president. He's supposed to take over. And so W.W. Uh, Phelps, uh, who's an important um, in church publishing, and also he's the guy who wrote the hymns like Spirit of God, Like a Fire is Burning, um, he is one of the counselors in the Missouri presidency, along with David Whitmer's brother, John Whitmer, who is the original church historian. And so if you've ever heard of the John Whitmer Historical Association, which is the um, historical association associated with Community of Christ, that's named for John Whitmer, who was the first historian of the church. So um, one of the things that happens in this period of frontier settlement is that as people, um, settlers, move into the lands and buy lands from the government. They organize counties and they create little county seats and everything like that. And, and so counties are constantly being proposed. And so because the Mormons had gotten kicked out of Jackson County, and that was clearly um, not, a, uh, not a legal thing, so they, they owned land there, but they were just not allowed to uh, go back to their land. And so that was a scandal. And so the state of Missouri sort of said, look, we got a lot of land here. And so we, there's no way we can reconcile it. There, you can't keep living as refugees in Clay County and the other counties. You have to move somewhere. You aren't going to be able to move back to Jackson County, but there's plenty of land. So we want to propose that we're going to make a county just for Mormons, just for the Latter-day Saints who have been kicked out of Jackson County. And so they looked at this area uh, north of Ray County, um, and said, "Let what about that? What if we what if we set aside at that county?" And so what they ended up creating, the Missouri Legislature ended up creating um, two counties up there. The first one being Caldwell County, and then the second one being Davies County. And um, and Caldwell County is is kind of actually specifically set aside to be um, the Latter Day Saint County, and so that's not legal that you can't actually do that you know so the united states can't you know say okay we're going to make a county just for catholics or something like that that was not um what they did legally so it doesn't say that anywhere that that's what the goal is but the idea of it was the the nod nod wink wink thing is okay yeah you guys can have that one and we'll just let you be there and that'll that'll solve this problem uh and so that was the kind of the deal that david whitmer and the missouri church members made um Joseph Smith and the people back in Ohio who haven't had to be living as refugees, they're, they've been building their temple and they've been doing, they, they, want, they still want to go to Jackson County because they have this prophecy that that's going to be where the New Jerusalem is. Um, but for the people that have been living as refugees, the people are in Missouri, they're pretty happy to be able to stop um, living 
you know, on other people's land and instead have, you know, get to building their own farms and getting their lives back. And so they start moving to Caldwell County. Okay, so that's all happening in Missouri. So let's go back to Kirtland. So after that amazing success that happened with the building of the temple and the Pentecostal season of the outpouring of the spirit, um, the next year is not as good. <laughs> so one of the problems is that, that in building that temple, um, they just went into just crazy debt. They, that's something that they couldn't afford. And so they, um, they went into debt in order to do it. And so as a result of that, um, uh, as a result of their creditors, um, they had this idea, well, if we had our own bank, and so at this time period, um, so we, nowadays when you go to a country, a country makes its own money and everything like that. At this point, banks were the ones that were printing um, paper money. It wasn't all just U.S. money. And so each individual bank is kind of doing that. And so um, at this time then in 1837, the early members of the church decided, okay, if we make our own bank, then we're going to be able to be in control of our own finances. The problem is they didn't know anything about banking. Nobody had ever been involved in a bank. And so when they made their bank, um, the Ohio state government um, refused to grant it an actual charter. There was no, there was no reason they should have granted it a charter because it had no backing and they didn't understand uh, banking. There was nothing behind it. There was all kinds of people who were trying to get bank charters too and there were plenty of them that didn't get chartered and so that wasn't anything special but they certainly weren't have theirs charted um, when they started done printing money they they stamped on it anti-banking society so they were making they were making money as a fake bank <laughs> and um, and there was nothing behind it so in theory you had to have um, uh, capital behind the notes that you're passing around gold and that kind of thing uh, and instead, um, the capital, the only capital that the bank actually had was all of the property or the lots that theoretically existed in Kirtland, which were um, said to be worth just so much more money than they were actually worth. If you know anything about property speculation, um, there can be a property bubble. You can, in, in theory, property is worth whatever anybody's willing to pay for it. And so because um, property values seem to be rapidly inflated in Kirtland, um, there seemed to be lots of capital behind it. The problem with it was um, when people came and demanded, okay, I have all this money from the bank. I want, I want this exchange for gold or something like that, or I want it for the capital. Um, unfortunately, when that happened, they couldn't, um, they couldn't, you can't do it with land. You can't just say, okay, well, you can have my, my plot, plot of land then. I mean, that's not, it wasn't, it wasn't possible. And indeed, actually, the property values also collapsed at the same time. So um, everybody went bankrupt, essentially. So the bank collapsed and it was a horrible, horrible scandal. So what happened? So um, there were schisms in the church as a result of that. So one of the things that happens is when um, you take all of the early members who had any money and you bankrupt them, they get upset. <laughs> and so, so as a result of that, and um, we have kind of here in this chart, you see this kind of period of time in 1836, 1837, where there's these two nuclei of the Church of Latter-day Saints. There's that Missouri nucleus where the Whitmers are in charge with Oliver Cowdery. And then there's that Kirtland nucleus where Smith, Sidney, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon are. Um, the bank collapses. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and about a thousand loyalists from Ohio uh, flee Ohio to escape their creditors uh, and they move to Missouri. And so the Kirtland nucleus remains uh, and the dissidents, in fact, actually reorganize their church. Uh, they excommunicate uh, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon. They call their church the Church of Christ uh, and they try to uh, go on uh, without them. It doesn't last very long. Uh, but in any event, that's kind of what happens. And meanwhile, the, the story rolls on to Missouri. So what happened with the folks in Kirtland? Um, when you are doing this thing where, you, um, where you're trying to reform a church, you kind of ask, well, when did the church go wrong? And they, they all know, okay, well, when we tried to make that bank, <laughs> you know, that was a mistake. Uh, but they also kind of started to look back at a lot of things that had been happening in the 1830s. And they um, and and so the people in the Church of Christ in Kirtland said, well, really, um, when we marched in Zion's camp, when we took up arms and had that horrible fiasco, um, that was a mistake. Uh, they also 
said, look, we originally were called the Church of Christ uh, in, back in 1834. We changed the name of the church to Church of the Latter-day Saints. That's a mistake because that's not what it's called in the, in the New Testament. It's, not, um, like, it's like being the Methodist or something. That's not what we want. When we introduced non-scriptural offices like First Presidency, and in fact, then what they ultimately decide, though, was when they accepted Joseph Smith as a prophet and the Book of Mormon as scripture, that that also is a mistake. And so that church quickly kind of unravels the onion and they're not really left with anything. And so it ultimately, um, as they reject everything about the church and the movement, it ultimately dissolves. All right, so this is the map of that county in Missouri that I mentioned, Caldwell County, that the state of Missouri created just for Latter-day Saints. And so um, the green area is just land in general. The um, colored in areas uh, are the zones that people, um, early members of the church bought uh, while, you know, during that time period. And so you can see in kind of in the, it's mostly concentrated in the um, the left-hand side, which is, say, the western side of the county, and that includes the county seat, which is called Far West, so that's the new headquarters of the church. And then you can see along through the middle of the county is a creek called Shoal Creek, and along that creek is where another settlement in the eastern portion of the county, which is called Hans Mill, is, and so that's going on in that. Um, far West becomes the new church headquarters. This is kind of a plot plat of how they wanted to do again this Zionic community, this perfect grid that they laid it out. Um, essentially nothing of this survived and so because they were only there for such a short amount of time um, none of the roads, nothing that they did to do the survey of it, um, nothing, none of that survived and so there's really almost um, with the exception of the of the the temple excavation itself, um, nothing marks any more far west. Far west is totally gone. Um, I want to talk just for a second about the name of the church. I mentioned um, that the original name of the church in 1830 is Church of Christ, that be right before they um, went on their march to Zion's camp and, and had their uh, mistaken military attempt to take arms up, they changed the name of the church to Church of the Latter-day Saints although the people in Missouri didn't really accept that change, but that's kind of what the church got called in Ohio. Um, when the leaders from Ohio relocated to Missouri, they came up with a compromise name. And so because people wanted the thing to be called Church of Christ and they didn't think Church of the Latter-day Saints explained that Christ was the most important thing in the church, they changed the name of the church to Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so... Um, Lots of churches in the movement are called Church of Christ. Some of them are called Church of Jesus Christ. A bunch of them are called Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, including um, the large Mormon church in Utah, which has been known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from 1844 till the present. Um, uh, the other uh, community, when we talk about Community of Christ, um, Community of Christ was known for a while as the new organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and then for a time, legally, it was known as the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In 2001, uh, we changed the name to Community of Christ, which comes back, harkens back to that original name, Church of Christ, but also um, talks about the heritage of uh, embracing community and emphasizing community. And so those are, those are the names of the church, sort of. Okay. <laughs> so this is still complicated. This is a little bit of a complicated diagram. So we saw before about um, um, how, what had happened in this diagram uh, between Missouri and Kirtland and how that Kirtland branch at the bottom of this chart um, became essentially the Church of Christ that ceases to exist as they unpeel the onion. Um, in Missouri, uh, what kind of happens is as the Ohio leaders, as Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon come and try to assert control over the church in Missouri, um, they end up uh, having a fight with the people who had been the leaders of the church in Missouri, David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery. And so they kick those guys out of the church and those guys have to flee uh, from far west. And so they um, aren't able to be involved in the church anymore. And as I say, at that point, um, the church changes its name to Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in general, um, they 
the new leaders, the leaders that have been from Ohio, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon, um, have uh, abrogate kind of all of the um, all of the kind of deals that the Missouri church had made to make peace with the Missourians. And so now they're not going to um, just stay in their county that they've been given. Um, they have a new kind of aggressive and expansionistic idea um, that very quickly uh, uh, that very quickly enrages the uh, non-Mormon settlers all around them. And so um, one of the things that happens, uh, is that uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go to this map. So there becomes uh, there becomes a whole bunch of incidents where uh, where fighting escalates. Um, there uh, you can see here in this particular map the kind of the yellow map county is Caldwell County. The Mormons start to create settlements outside of that county. So over in Carroll County they have a settlement called Dewitt, and then up above in Davies County they have a settlement called. Adam on Di um, And so then what ends up happening is that both sides of the frontier people essentially here have their own militias. Um, the Missourian militias tend to be actually legal state militias of the in individual counties. Um, the Mormons, in addition to having their own kind of state militia, they also organize a, um, a illegal paramilitary band called the Danites. Um, and and this kind of comes to armed conflict. So the Missourians uh, besiege DeWitt kind of illegally and try to get the Mormons to leave DeWitt, to leave Carroll County. Uh, in response, the Mormons uh, go to Davies County. Uh, they besiege all of the non-Mormon settlements there and sack actually the county seat, uh, burn all the farms of all the non-Mormons non and kick them all out. Um, and so this ultimately results in a... Um, you know, a minor civil war, but the Mormons don't have anywhere near the, um, you know, the fighting against the entire state of Missouri. So the state of Missouri calls out its militia and ultimately um, wins. And the uh, early settlers, other early members, all have to um, surrender or be killed. So they surrender. Um, there is, in the meantime, uh, a mob, a Missourian mob that's an illegal militia that commits a massacre at a place called Hans Mill. And so, um, anyway, ultimately what ends up happening is that all of the early members are kicked out and expelled from Missouri. Missouri is no longer going to be safe, and so they all leave, you know, essentially fleeing as uh, property illicit refugees, except for the core leaders like Joseph Smith that are arrested for treason. Uh, and everybody else has to flee as best they can to Illinois, where they're just desperately poor and coming as refugees at the end of this, at the end of this time period. So... Um, so that's a lot of movement and a lot of things going on in, in um, this amount of time. But essentially what we can see here is the movement from New York to Kirtland to Missouri and now to Nauvoo, which is the last um, um, place where uh, in this kind of time period, the last time that in the early period that the um, church members try to build a new communitarian city again. And so when they get there in the 1839 context, this is... Uh, this Lincoln Douglas era, uh, when Lincoln and Douglas are having the, the, you know their debates a little later on here, um, and that's when they arrive. There is a pre-existing rivalry that the Illinoisans have within with the Missourians, and so the Illinoisans are very happy to welcome the refugees and uh, and to be quite antagonistic to the Missourians who see, are now seen as very unjust in dispossessing these poor people, and so what ends up happening is that because um, the two political parties at the time, the Whigs and the Democrats. So Abraham Lincoln is a Whig and, and, and uh, Douglas is a Democrat. Um, both of them are kind of equally balanced. And so they both want to court the Mormon vote as all these Mormons are entering into the state. And so um, they end up moving to a county called Hancock County, which is kind of at the border of Iowa, Missouri, and Illinois. Um, and they start moving into a city there uh, called Nauvoo. So I would argue that actually this is a, a major mistake, that they probably should have moved to the Iowa Territory because one of the things we always see is that um, Zion and Gathering and everything else work best where on the frontier where land is cheap. Um, unfortunately, um, Hancock County on the Illinois side uh, ended had a lot of pre-existing settlements and things like that who had 
interest in their own property. And so ultimately, by being on this side of the river, by getting wooed by Illinois politicians, um, it put the church in a much more precarious situation ultimately. One of the things that happened um, as they moved there, um, there were like lots of hangers on who kind of emerged out of the woodwork to try to hitch their star to um, this movement. And one of these guys, uh, one of the most important of these guys that happened is this person named John C. Bennett. Um, and so Bennett had finagled himself into becoming quartermaster of the Illinois State Militia. He has a lot of connections in Springfield, which is the capital of Illinois. He helps write and pass a Nauvoo City charter. That charter apparently has sweeping powers, but in fact, it actually it actually probably really legally didn't, but the people in Nauvoo thought it did. Um, and because of this, even though he's just a joins the church at this moment. Um, he becomes just Joseph Smith's best friend. He becomes mayor of Nauvoo, so this colony that the uh, early church members are gonna um, found. And then also he's general in the city militia. He's chancellor of their university. They never really have a university, but they, they try to pretend that they do. And he becomes a member of the church's first presidency. Uh, and so he ends up being just an incredibly important figure in this period, especially initially. So as I mentioned, Bennett um, essentially is able to get a charter passed uh, in the Illinois legislature that allows Nauvoo to run. So unlike in in Missouri, where the Mormons actually had you know we had their own county, but they were operating nevertheless an illegal um, militia, the Danites. Uh, now um, they have a free and open charter which allows them to create a uh, militia called the Nauvoo Legion. Um, the, uh, the city is allowed to make its own ordinances as long as those ordinances aren't unconstitutional. The city is given its own courts. Um, it's also allowed to create a university. Um, and so in other words, there's all of these different things that the charter allows. And unfortunately, one of the things that happened is Joseph Smith and other leaders, um, they developed a kind of an exaggerated view of what the charter uh, was allowed, and they ultimately very seriously abused the charter um, and caused uh, a lot of upset from all of their neighbors as a result of that. Um, so I'm going to show this. This is a picture that we have at Toronto Center Place. We have a reproduction of it. Um, this is a painting by David Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith's son, of kind of the um, river town of Nauvoo after after it um, after its failure but you can kind of see um, some of the important sites so the mansion house uh, just joseph smith's residence the nauvoo house which was the unfinished it was going to be much taller um, you know grand hotel uh, for this river town and the red brick store which is served as the church headquarters so this is kind of the final settlement in the early phase and you can see um, from this map i made of it uh, that they tried again to do this perfect grid and much more of it actually got built. These are um, all of the different buildings, including the darker red ones are like brick buildings that they actually built. Most of them are still all wood, but um, they were able to really um, have this city take off in a couple of years, unlike far west of which nothing survives. And so this is like actually an early photograph and you can see the original Nauvoo temple. Um, it was ultimately destroyed, but there's a replica built. Um, but this is one of the rare um, photographs, actually, of it. Um, and one of the, each of the columns around uh, had a capital with this sunstone on. And so one of the things that happens now is um, there is a divergence. Um, as you saw the Kirtland Temple, it's, it's uh, other than the pulpits, um, it really is very similar to any other kind of New England church. It doesn't look all that different. Um, now... The Nauvoo Temple has some very obscurely different stuff, the sunstone, moonstone, star stones, uh, the baptismal fonts, and other kinds of things that are inside it that are, make it very different. So outsiders, when they saw this very rapidly growing, seemingly successful uh, city, um, they were threatened by it. So Mormons block voted, they dominate the county elections, they openly played and betrayed actually both political parties and so they were trying to you know play both sides essentially of the Whigs and the Democrats. The Nauvoo courts would consistently acquit Mormon defendants and there was essentially no recourse against um, a practice called 
consecration where Mormons would say, go and steal somebody's horse. They would bring it back to Nauvoo and consecrate it to the bishop or whatever it was going to be. They now have it be their horse. The person would come and say, that's my horse. Um, and they'd even if they bring a sheriff with them with a writ to get it back, um, what would immediately happen is, is that the Nauvoo court would ri issue a writ of habeas corpus, which said that the trial had to be had in Nauvoo. They'd bring out a whole bunch of uh, Mormon jurors who would immediately rule in favor of the thief. And so as a result of that, when you start to steal people's property um, and there's no recourse, that's a people aren't going to stand for that. Property is the basis of, of Western civilization, essentially. So Mormons also had a highly, were highly militant and they had a militia of 2,500 men of an under arms. Joseph Smith um, liked to be in his militia uniform and he liked actually his title general um, more than any of his other titles. And so this was also scary for people. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that kind of had happened by the end is that uh, the situation became a theocracy where there was almost total concentration of power in one man's hands. So Joseph Smith at the end is simultaneously mayor, he's general of the militia, he's head of the municipal court, he's president and prophet of the church, he's editor of the church's press, and by the way, he also had himself crowned king secretly in a secret ceremony. So he's king of the kingdom of God on earth by the end. So kind of quite frankly out of control in terms of this um, concentration of power. So um, one of the things that we'll just mention in terms of this kingdom business, um, when before the church is organized, um, Joseph Smith and the others restore priesthood. And so they have priesthood offices in 1829. Then they restore the church in 1830. And now Joseph Smith in 1844 says, well, now we are going to restore what's called the kingdom of God on earth in anticipation of uh, Christ coming in the millennial kingdom. Um, the other core thing besides the theocracy um, that is going on that is creating a scandal is polygamy. And so as early as 1829, Joseph Smith is kind of contemplating and thinking about the practice of polygamy. And so actually in the Book of Mormon, there is a condemnation of polygamy. Um, but in other words, it's on Joseph Smith's mind as early as that. Um, as early in... Uh, 1838, we mentioned how uh, the Whitmers got kicked out of the church. Part of the reason why um, they were on the outs with Joseph Smith and uh, was that Oliver Cowdery, who was married to one of the Whitmers, um, and the other Whitmer family were upset with Joseph Smith over him, Joseph having an affair with a um, maid in his household named Fanny Alger. Um, so Fanny is retrospectively understood to be Joseph Smith's first plural wife. Um, whether or not he's actually practicing polygamy or he's just having an affair, it was enough to upset and break with um, Cowdery and the Whitmers. But certainly by Nauvoo, Joseph Smith is privately teaching in 1841 a practice that comes to be known as celestial marriage. Uh, nevertheless, he is publicly condemning polygamy, so he's speaking out in public against the practice of polygamy, but that's with a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and internally he's saying because polygamy is the Satan's um, corrupt version of God's true principle, which is celestial marriage, which is, by the way, polygamy. So, um, in May 1843, Emma, um, who had been deceived, uh, lied to by Joseph Smith about the extent of the practice in Nauvoo, she understands that something's going on, but she doesn't realize how widespread it is. Spread it is. She was temporarily coerced um, into accepting the practice, and um, even though, that, again, publicly they're denying it, and so then for the rest of her life, she continues this Joseph Smith's policy of publicly denying polygamy, even though she was aware of its practice in her life. So all of this, the theocracy, um, the stealing, the, uh, the polygamy, comes to a head and um, comes to a head when Joseph Smith uses his powers to destroy a, uh, an opposition press. Uh, and when he destroys essentially freedom of the press in Nauvoo, uh, that causes a, an outcry. Uh, the state to act, they arrest him. And while he is in state custody, a mob that is actually consisting of state militia guys um, um, assassinate him and his brother. And so that occurs in 1844.
So when that happens, um, essentially the Smith family, which had been running the movement, uh, is in, pretty much in disarray. So Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith, and even their brother Samuel Smith all die at around the same time. There's only the youngest brother, William, who is left uh, in that generation. And he, although as an apostle, is actually off running the Eastern Church, and his wife is sick, so he's not even in anywhere near church headquarters during uh, this time. Um, Joseph Smith III, although he had been uh, ordained many times uh, to be you know, in blessings, uh, Joseph Smith had predicted that he would be his successor. Nevertheless, he's a boy of 11 years old, and so that obviously can't happen at the time of Joseph Smith's death. Instead, there are kind of a vast number of succession alternatives. And so we talked about Sidney Rigdon right at the start. So he was one of essentially the co-founders of the church, and he's also still in the First Presidency. He's the last surviving member of the First Presidency. Many people feel that he should be the person who is in charge now. There's William Marks, who's president of the presiding High Council. There's Brigham Young, who is president of the Council of Twelve Apostles. William Smith, as I mentioned, who uh, is essentially the last surviving um, Smith family male in, in that generation who's an adult. Um, and then there's some other folks. So um, on this here, I'm listing off who's members of the Council of 50. The Council of 50 is that, that last restoration Joseph Smith had of the kingdom. So the kingdom is led by a Council of 50 guys. Uh, and the most senior of which are, are the oldest. And so Lyman White as one, and Alphaeus Cutler are both on that council. They both outrank um, people like David, I'm sorry, Brigham Young and William Marks because they're both older. Um, as I mentioned, Joseph III is just a little boy, and so he is not um, really an alternative in the, immediately. David Whitmer is technically not in the church, but he had been... Um, ordained to be the successor if something happened to Joseph Smith, and many people remembered that. And then finally, there emerges this very interesting um, potential successor, Joseph James Strang, um, who, uh, is, who claims that he was ordained by angels to be the prophet uh, immediately upon Joseph Smith's death. And so he becomes actually quite a, a strong alternative uh, to the other leaders. We already had a, a whole lecture on him. Um, ultimately, um, in terms of Nauvoo and at headquarters, um, uh, it becomes a showdown between really should Sidney Rigdon be running it or should uh, uh, Brigham Young. Uh, they have a, a kind of a debate. Brigham Young absolutely wins that. And so he ends up um, taking leadership of church headquarters. And so ultimately, although he initially probably would like to be able to have stayed in Nauvoo um, because he essentially doubled down because he continued to do all of the different practices that the Illinoisans were objecting to. So polygamy, uh, uh, the, the consecration, the stealing, all those kinds of things. Um, he and his group were forced out and they um, make their migration west and ultimately end up in, in Utah. Um, the other different group leaders here start organizing in other different ways. So Sidney Rigdon goes back to Pennsylvania. James Strang organizes his church in Wisconsin and later up on Vera Island in Michigan. Um, uh, David Whitmer um, continues to be in Missouri. Uh, Lyman White uh, leads a very successful colony to Texas. Um, George Hinkle already had an opposition church in Iowa. Alphaeus Cutler also decides to lead his own group in Iowa. And uh, William Law, who had had a, a reformed church in Nauvoo, ultimately leaves the church. But William Smith ends up having his own church kind of in Illinois as well. So there ends up being a bunch of different potential alternatives and indeed rival organizations in schism with each other. And so that can be shown also here in terms of the map as everybody moved from Nauvoo. So Brigham Young and his followers moving west initially actually out of the country into Mexico, although it's right then during the Mexican-American War. And so that quickly becomes uh, a U returns to being or becomes a U.S. territory. So they are suddenly find themselves in the U.S. They tried to get away. Um, but you can also see sort of where James Strang is at up in, in Beaver Island and also Sidney Rigdon going back to Pittsburgh. And meanwhile, uh, the Cutlerites, the Whiteites down in Texas and so on. So... In some ways, uh, the schism at the end is, is in part all about polygamy and so much about actually um, 
Latter-day Saint history starts to revolve around polygamy. So as I mentioned, um, polygamy is being secretly practiced uh, among leaders in Nauvoo as of 1841. In 1843, this is when uh, Joseph Smith actually dictates a uh, polygamy revelation in order to try to uh, get Emma to submit to the practice, which she does temp very temporarily. Uh, the very next year, as I mentioned, Joseph Smith is killed. Um, initially, um, Strang was a strong uh, opponent of polygamy. Um, and as I say, Brigham Young and his followers are all practicing it. Um, William Smith uh, is following um, Joseph Smith's model of denouncing polygamy publicly while secretly practicing it. And so he initially merges his uh, church with Strang, but Strang catches him essentially committing or practicing polygamy and excommunicates it. Strang, though, becomes a polygamist in 1849. <laughs> um, Isaac Sheen um, catches William Smith uh, practicing polygamy in William Smith's own church, which causes um, William Smith's church to excommunicate him <laughs> from his own church for pro polygamy. And ultimately, um, as a result of that, uh, when 1852, when Brigham Young which has, and his group, which had been practicing polygamy, um, pretty obviously and in large numbers, but they'd done so still very secretly where they were not, they were denying that they were doing it. In 1852, they took the curtain off and they said, no, we're absolutely practicing um, polygamy now. So when that happens, that causes a, you know, a real break with the movement and lots of different uh, groups um, feel that they can't be a part of that anymore. Um, and then ultimately, um, James Strang, which has, has been practicing polygamy is, is also killed. So one of the things that occurs in this time period from 1844 to 1860 is that almost all of the rival leaders end up um, either dying or, or having their movements dissolve or um, you know, being in extremely poor health. So Lyman White, um, after initial successes in Texas, by 1856 he's died. Uh, same thing, James Strang is martyred. Um, in, even though he had a, quite a successful colony in Michigan. Um, Charles Thompson, who created a town in Iowa, um, ended up pissing off all of his followers who um, sue him and, and his church collapses. Alphaeus Cutler um, had become extremely ill by the end and was addicted to lanolin and things like that. So his church dissolved as did Zadok Brooks Church in, in Ohio. So essentially the only structure that survived uh, it was touch and go at the beginning when they first got out to Utah and all of the crickets were eating all their grain and everything else. But ultimately, Brigham Young and his organization end up being successful and um, and end up being really the only uh, organizations left by the time we get to 1860, uh, which is one of the reasons why then the reorganization happens in the Midwest. Um, um, so one of the takeaways of though for all of the different groups um, is that as the different groups were having their ways of having succession and arguing who should be uh, the leader, they end up getting trapped in that 1844 experience. And so because Brigham Young was the senior most apostle uh, when he became leader, um, the practice that emerges in his group in the LDS church is that the senior most apostle always succeeds. And so as a result of that, after Brigham Young, he wanted to have his sons succeed him so that they could be, he could establish a young dynasty. Instead, what it ends up happening is the senior most apostle, John Taylor, succeeds him. And so all the way to the present day, that's always what happens. And so the current president of the Mormon church is the senior most of the 15 Mormon apostles. And that's why they're always in their 90s and everything like that. Meanwhile, James Strang, the leader of the Strangite Church, said, no, that apostles don't have any right of succession at all. The only way you can have a successor is if an angel comes and appoints the person to be prophet. Um, and so because that hasn't happened ever since James Strang died, there has been no successor. And so the Strangite Church hasn't had any prophets since James Strang. Uh, meanwhile, in, in the community of Christ, um, because the leader had appointed the successor, so Joseph Smith had appointed his son to be his successor, and also because um, he was his son, so he was in the Smith family. What ends up happening is, is that uh, leaders all the way up through the um, all the way up through the 90s are in the Smith family, uh, and then also in general they were appointed by by their predecessor, and so. Anyway, 
because of how um, how this succession crisis worked out, that has affected each one of the successor churches. And I just am mentioning a couple of them here. And so I know that was a lot of details and, and we actually went longer than I had originally hoped, but that is um, my, as brief as I can make it, summary of origins of the Latter-day Saint movement and Latter-day Saint history till 1860. And so hopefully you found that interesting and um, I wanna invite any comments and questions and um, if I'll try to, try to answer them. Uh, it was a lot of information and so Hopefully some of that was new for you and, and interesting. We'll see from Leandro if there are messages. So the answer is yes, there are questions. So Leon, um, Leon de Berg asks, uh, are there historians that believe Joseph Smith Jr. purposefully pushed out from position or influence or distance himself from the Whitmers and other original community Church of Christ New York State followers and aligned himself more with Ringden and uh, the Ohio Church of Christ. So, um, so what ended up happening is that when Sidney Rigdon um, first started to, to become involved with Joseph Smith, he was such an important person and he had so many followers that yes, he, he in the very early time periods, um, Sidney Rigdon definitely was displacing people like Oliver Cowdery, who had been a very um, important collaborator with Joseph Smith when he's trying to write the Book of Mormon, but was less relevant in terms of trying to lead a church. And so yes, the um, initially uh, Sidney Rigdon is eclipsing um, these other early New York leaders that Joseph Smith had to work with before he got hold of Sidney Rigdon. Later, after um, after they get to Nauvoo, after they get to Illinois, Sidney Rigdon's kind of not the new kid on the block anymore, and Joseph Smith is more interested in people like John C. Bennett, or ultimately John C. Bennett's kind of successor in that same job, Brigham Young, and so uh, that becomes those become more critical leaders later. Jordy Frame writes, but surely to have uh, gone right by not accepting Joseph as a prophet or his book as scripture would result in not coming into existence. And I wouldn't um, be watching this as it fades like Marty's photo on the back of the future, L L LOL. Yeah, so so to your, to your point, I think you're talking about when we were talking about the, um, the, uh, the parish church of Christ, the church that stayed in Kirtland. Um, and so this is a problem that a lot of members had um, as they unpeel the onion. And this happened to the Rigdonite church too. That happen It happens fairly frequently because once you kind of decide that recent stuff is wrong, you don't always know when to stop. And so to your point, um, yeah, a lot of the churches, when they do that, they, they cease to exist. And so you have to, you have to, um, the, one of the reasons why um, the LDS church has been successful is that uh, Brigham Young was pretty firm about deciding, okay, we're going to stay frozen in 1844. And what we're going to do is we have the fulfillment, fulfillment of everything. We're not going to, we're going to keep 1844. Um, and likewise, Joseph Smith III looked back to that vision of that Pentecostal time, this wonderful season of triumph uh, in Kirtland. And that was kind of the rallying vision. Let's go back to um, the way things were, you know, when things were good in 1836 in Kirtland or 1837 in Kirtland, not, um, not later. So, so, um, and so those kind of things, and that way you don't, you don't unravel the whole thing. Uh, Roan Wagner, can you talk more about introducing the leadership into the Masons? And so, um, so Freemasonry, um, had been, it was very important at this time period in, in the United States. And so, um, there had been a, but people had been also worried that Freemasons were going to take over and that, that there was a huge Freemasonry scandal that was actually taking place um, immediately prior to the publication of the Book of Mormon. And so the Book of Mormon includes um, an allegory to how um, Freemasons could overthrow or how a, a secret society like that could potentially overthrow a republic. And so, so in some cases, so, um, so uh, some historians, uh, you know, have talked about uh, the Book of Mormon as being actually an anti-Masonic tract. Um, but 
people got over that it wasn't masons weren't as scary by 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 the time Nauvoo rolls around and um and so people like bennett who were masons introduced freemasonry to Nauvoo Joseph Smith became a freemason um they had a very irregular lodge in Nauvoo where they um essentially uh like you're not supposed to do this but you essentially I don't know how masonry works in every way but you have all these different orders and grades and so Joseph Smith graduated to being a top level mason after just like two weeks or something crazy and not something that's totally not allowed and then they started making everybody a mason which you're not allowed to do either and they started making everybody a high level mason so suddenly everybody in this Nauvoo chapter of the masons are the highest ranking masons in all of Illinois and so the, the state is opposed to that but a month after um a month after Joseph Smith is introduced to masonry, he creates um, the Mormon temple endowment, which is directly taken from uh, to masonry. So um, I don't have all of the details on that, but there's whole books and many studies on it. And that's quite conclusive. So um, Susan uh, Raines writes, what happened to John C. Bennett? <laughs> so Bennett um, and Joseph Smith had a falling out. Uh, and so... Um, it it looks like I think that Joseph Smith probably was was going to be willing to um, get over it and things like that, but it ultimately ends up because his uh, the other people are so jealous of Bennett, they want to get rid of him, and so as soon as that he's down, they won't let him come back, and so um, Bennett becomes a scapegoat and early on for um, some of the excesses in Nauvoo, including for polygamy and other things, and so once Bennett is sure that he's um, out he immediately goes he's a self-promoter and so he immediately writes this big expose book and he actually knows a lot of the secrets and he goes on a very successful two-year lecture tour where he's selling his book and exposing all of joseph smith's secrets and he makes a lot of money you know and becomes quite famous doing that um then people don't care anymore and so he has to go and have other jobs he has a bunch of other jobs so he um he's one of the people who um, popularized tomatoes and it's got people to actually eat tomatoes they thought they were poisonous before that he's a guy who actually um, creates a, a um, trend of of raising fancy chickens and so he popularizes breeds like uh, the Bamapuchas and the Plymouth rock hens and things like that and he ultimately um, becomes associated with James Strang uh, who um, who I think you know gives him his old position back in the church and um and he essentially has a has a um has a sequel in mormonism you know in james strang's movement uh, uh he he lives a he's predicted um to you know like people predicted that he was going to die and live a horrible life and all these kind of things but actually he lived just a fine life and um uh he uh, is buried in in uh north of des moines and you know lived to a ripe old age so that's what happened to Bennett. Uh, Mary Grace Allred writes, so would you say that the LDS Church and Community of Christ have equal claims to priesthood? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, the priesthood, by the way, exists total, you know, as we saw in that when I made the charts, priesthood exists before the church. And so priesthood has its own organization anyway that existed before the church is even reorganized. Priesthood is reorganized. Um, and and so all of the churches um, have priesthood lines that I think have been pretty continuous. Um, both of them, uh, different people have different priesthood theories. And so, um, so the Strangites have a different understanding than, than the Community of Christ has, and Community of Christ has a different understanding than the LDS Church. Um, and so there is different theories of priesthood. And so the Community of Christ theory of priesthood is significantly different from the LDS Church's theory. But in terms of... Um, in terms of lineage, if lineage has any meaning, um, uh, both of them are, I think, are, are equal. Leon asked, to follow up, was Joseph Jr. too easily influenced by newcomers and strong personalities like Rigdon and Bennett? Um, was Joseph Smith Jr. possibly unable to lead without a strong inner circle? So he's, Joseph, yeah, so Joseph Smith very quickly, you know, will f get involved with some new guy like Oliver Cowdery, like um, uh, like Sidney Rigdon, you know, and, and he'll bring them in and they'll become extremely important. You know, Bennett is another example. And so um, when that kind of happens, he was a 
he was a um, a very flexible thinker and so joseph smith i mean rapidly i mean so for example they had, had nothing to do with masonry if anything the book of mormon was anti-masonic then suddenly joseph smith is exposed to masonry and he then incorporates it into his religion right <laughs> And so, um, so he was very, he was flexible and adaptable, and so he was always ready to bring new things in. That was exciting for a whole bunch of people. So a lot of people loved Joseph Smith because of all the new stuff all the time, and so they liked that. Other people, though, would be like, "Wait a second, I was totally committed to what we were doing before, and now I don't really see what we're doing now as, or what you're talking about now as what we were doing back in New York and things like that." And so I would say that. Um, there's advantages to that kind of flexibility and adaptability, um, but then there's also drawbacks, you know, in terms. So he was constantly throwing off followers who were not on board with where things were, were going now. And like you say, it's kind of susceptible to um, uh, to influence by other personalities. And so, um, yeah, he definitely, in order to have uh, an organization, if you're ever gonna, um, you can't just do everything on, on your own. You have to have followers around you who who put into practice the things that you're telling them to do. And so he definitely would rely on different people for that. So Elizabeth has been says she's been reading Benjamin Park's new book, Kingdom of Nauvoo. How cool. Um, Benjamin Park's a um, great scholar and uh, somebody who I've known for a very long time since he was a student, I think. Uh, first sentence, a gloomy pall hung over the Mormon city of Nauvoo when Joseph Smith and his closest allies gathered to replace the American Constitution. I didn't mention that Joseph Smith ran for president <laughs> and Park doesn't mention horse stealing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, so I can't, couldn't talk about everything. So um, I, so yes, Joseph Smith was running for president at the end and that was really the, the most important thing to him. Um, every, he had sent all the leaders of the church off uh, on political missions in order to, um, uh, in order to campaign for the presidency. Uh, and so Sidney Rigdon was his running mate and Sidney Rigdon had relocated to Pennsylvania so that he could have a, so the vice president could have a different state residence than, um, than the presidential candidate. And Joseph Smith, even though it's insane, you know, because again, he's surrounded by yes men and things like that. I think he really believed that he had a shot uh, via the, um, via the, uh, the, the House of Representative method of being made U.S. president. So if nobody gets a majority of the votes in the Electoral College, it gets thrown into the, uh, to the House of Representatives. And that had happened earlier with, um, with John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. And that was actually a strategy that the Whigs sometimes had, although the Whigs weren't very good strategically about these kind of things. So it never really ever worked. But anyway, he thought maybe that there'd be a horse deal and suddenly um, the House of Representatives would make him president. So I think he actually believed that and he was definitely trying to do that. Um, I think that the fact that the, you know, in terms of the horse stealing, um, that's the consecration is something that was ongoing. And, and that's one of the major complaints that um, non-Mormons had. And was one of the things that was upsetting to them. I don't think it was very widespread. It was much more rumored, uh, you know, rumored to be much bigger than it actually was. So what happens is once you do a little bit of that stealing, um, then every time anything goes missing or anytime any stealing happens, which was happening kind of rife in, a, in, in river town communities, which are rough and tumble anyway, um, then it's all blamed obviously on the people that you know are doing some of the stealings. So, okay, so Elizabeth also writes, banks issued their own money. Somewhere there's a $10 bill that by rights belongs to me, signed by my great-great-grandfather, issued by a little bank in Georgia. I expect those local currencies weren't used or accepted except very close to the bank that issued them. That's ex Yeah, that's exactly the case. And so like you say, that every banks were doing that. Um, anybody who has um, banknotes now from the Kirtland Safety Society, you know, they had, I've seen before like a, a Kirtland Safety Society anti-banking company, the church's bank here, um, in a three dollar bill, so it's queer as a three dollar bill, as they say. Um, that three dollar bill is would be worth just a massive amounts of money now because of the collector value. So the bank notes are actually worth way more than their um, at this point, way more than their face value, way way more. <laughs> okay, Rick McGregor writes: Is it true that none of the three witnesses denied the truth of the Book of Mormon? Yes. So um, 
The three witnesses are uh, Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer. Um, they all reported that they, uh, well, Oliver Cowdery didn't say too much about it uh, in terms of detail. David Whitmer is the one who talked about it the most. Martin Harris also talked about it. They, um, they both lived l nice long lives. Oliver Cowdery himself died uh, a couple years after Joseph Smith, and so he didn't actually live as long as the others. And um, they were, to their dying days, firm believers in um, uh, the Book of Mormon, although in both cases uh, were uh, definitely believed that Brigham Young had no right to be leading the church. And had, you know, so uh, Oliver Cowdery, for example, wrote to David Whitmer, the 12 have have uh, led their group off into the wilderness, but the 12 have not the keys, have not the priesthood keys to be leaders of the church. It's us, the, the witnesses who do. And so they had their own understanding. And so the Whitmerites had their, uh, David Whitmer was a leader of his own Whitmerite church in, to the end of his days. Uh, Martin Harris was involved in anybody who, Martin Harris was still living in Kirtland. He was pretty much involved in anybody's church who, any Latter-day Saint church that was existing in Kirtland until at the end of his life, he was very, very poor um, and moved uh, to charity. In he was moved to Utah so he could live on the charity of his relatives. And so technically was part of the Utah church by the end of his life. But um, Charles Boy, Chuck writes, um, does the fact that the early church members believed that Kirtland Temple was built as a result of divine revelation account for the fact that there was no architectural planning done? Um, no, I don't think so, Chuck. I just think that um, I just think that people didn't have plans. They didn't need plans. People were people started building without plans back then, and so we're very, um, you know, uh, it was a different era. It was a vernacular era, so it's um, uh, that nobody would have thought to make a plan. Um, it's just not that's just not how they how they operated. So. Uh, it's hard for us to even imagine. Nobody's thinking about maps. People always want to make a map of the Book of Mormon lands and all this kind of thing. There is no map. Uh, there, nobody, nobody was thinking about it. You know, Joseph Smith did not have a map in his head or anything like that because it wouldn't have been visual as a map. He would have had a an itinerary in his head, uh, a literary itinerary of what lands are next to which lands, and that's how they were also getting between. Um, Kirtland and Missouri. They knew that you go from this town to this town to this town to this town, and they're thinking about it as an itinerary to, in order to get there. Leon asks, is there any truth that uh, that Joseph Smith told Bennett that the high council, let the high council excommunicate you and I will baptize you again? So I think so. There's a very good um, uh, John C. Bennett biography that's totally worth the read. Um, if I have it here. Um, anyway, and, and I think that what had happened was that Bennett initially took a fall as kind of a, there was a scandal, Joseph Smith is getting um, some heat, Bennett takes like a fall for him as kind of as a scapegoat, and then after, and so Bennett lays low, Joseph Smith is ready to, to accept him back, uh, and, and he wants to, but what ends up happening, I think, is that all, as soon as People like Brigham Young and everybody who had been around for a long time hated Bennett because they're like, here's this guy who's essentially in the court. He's the new favorite. He's gotten all of these attention from Joseph Smith. He's got all the positions and everything else, and we should be getting that. And so as soon as Bennett was down, those guys just would not let him get back up. In other words, they were they would not. They're like no. And so so there was like a revolt of all the other underlings. Uh, when Joseph Smith wanted to bring uh, Bennett back. And so he, he pretty much just saw the, wind, the way the wind was blowing and, and cut Bennett loose. And so it's only then that Bennett, Bennett had been totally willing to play ball and all, do anything that was necessary. But once he realized that you know, he wasn't going to be accepted back in, that's when he um, goes and does his expose and everything like that. Rick McGregor writes, Are shirts available for purchase? I'm wearing my center place shirt, right? Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> that's what we got is the answer. We, we don't have those right now. Um, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? I'm wearing this because it's so hot here in the apartment. We don't have air conditioning. Um, so anyway, thanks for putting up with my informality here. Uh, Roan Wagner, are some of the practices of the LDS church taken from the practices of Freemasonry? Yes. So the, um, so 
Mormon church has a bunch of temples all around the world. And so the temples are very different from com the community of Christ's understanding of temples. So that's not what we do in Kirtland Temple or our temple in Independence. Um, but one of the major practices is a, um, a ritual that's called the endowment, which now it's now instead of having endowment, what it originally meant, which is um, empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's what originally it was. Now it's become a ritual and the ritual is also attached to a, what was originally a morality play uh, about, about Adam and Eve and this kind of thing. Uh, and then it became, um, became a movie. And so they do it as a movie and it's based on, um, that ritual is based on um, some free, Freemasonry kind of rituals. And so, yes. Um, uh, Doubtful Thomas asks, are Joseph Smith's last words um, of that of a Masonic phrase? So that's one of the uh, one of the um, understandings, yes. And so I don't know that, I don't know if all witnesses say that, but uh, certainly one of the stories about the end of Joseph Smith's life is, um, is there no help for the widow's son or something like that is one of his last um, things that he maybe is saying, because the hope would be uh, that among the mob who are um, trying to lynch him, um, that among those uh, guys who are essentially off-duty um, militiamen from uh, Warsaw, uh, neighboring town, that there might be a Mason. And so that would mean maybe you're kind of like your last hope is that, you know, since you're a Mason, then some other Freemason may, might stop um, the mob activity and, and help out. Um, that's, but it's not a, it's not a great hope because actually the Masons, I think are also, um, very mad at Joseph Smith and the Nauvoo Lodge, which is considered to be out of order for all of their irregular practices. Uh, and so actually other people think there's a Masonic conspiracy that the Masons are, you know, are, are part of the people that are behind the assassination, whether, you know, that's, I don't want to spread conspiracy theory, theories, but you know the fact that um, the fact that he's running for president is you know is also means that it's a political act when you um, when he's assassinated. So he's also a you know a presidential candidate who got assassinated. So there so there's a lot going on in in all of that. All right, uh, do we have any other any other questions or comments or just oh there's more okay. Well, one sec then. <laughs> so you're saying no more questions? Oh, okay. Well, very, very good. Well, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this is a fun topic. And of course, next week, we're going to take the story um, and look at the community of grace tradition, um, how the reorganization happened and, and what's happened in terms of uh, kind of the remarkable trajectory uh, from that point to the present uh, inclusive affirming uh, church the community of Christ has become today. So look forward to seeing you um, next week for that topic. Enjoy. <laughs>